as Peter mentioned, Yossi Yon. Congratulations are in order. Oh, thank you, Ariel Honor, being here, and Ariel Honor for Repsol uh, having this award. No, and so for those of you that haven't read your programs, <clears throat> this is the leadership dialogue for the winner of the Energy Intelligence Energy Innovation Award, and in 2023, Repsol took home the honor. Now, we'll formally present the award at a reception just across the hallway right after this session, but I want to take the time that we have together to dive into some of your thoughts around the transition and how Repsol is approaching it. And to start with, I wanted to understand, I mean, so we were talking uh, backstage a little bit around how you know, the, the view of, of the protesters here, the view of the energy transition maybe in London in general, isn't necessarily the same as we might see elsewhere. I mean, we have this, people often refer to this sort of monolithic idea of a, a European view of the energy transition, but the view of the transition is not so monolithic in Europe. Tell us a little bit more about that. So probably it's not so monolithic, not even in Britain. <laughs> I'm sure that if you take some British counties and you analyze the reality about this concern and you compare with London, it's not the same. Mm -hmm. If you take France and you take people from Paris and uh, all the southwest and west uh, France, uh, the, the position would be different. Same thing in Spain. I think that that's probably because uh, we are forgetting that the energy policy has to fulfill a trilemma. Mm -hmm. Guaranteeing the security of supply, guaranteeing affordability, and of course, doing that in a sustainable way. And I think that in, in, in Europe, in general terms, of many governments, we forgot that we have to guarantee security of supply and we built dependence on Russia. Mm -hmm. We forgot that we have to be, uh, we have to produce affordable energy, and uh, we built a situation where many families, they have problems to pay their energy bills. Many industries consuming energy, they have problems to compete in Europe. And we focus only on decarbonizing the world, and you could say, okay, we are succeeding on, on, on this one. My point is, we are also failing mm -hmm. doing that. Why? Uh, first of all, because we have a very dogmatic approach to what is uh, this uh, energy transition. And if we don't take a comprehensive, holistic view about the problem, the consequence could be what we have seen over the last two years, that in Europe we need to buy gas uh, over the whole world. We have multiplied by three, four, five the gas price. Many emerging countries, they can't afford paying the energy they need and they are shifting to coal. And the paradox is that in 2020, we, are, we have seen a dramatic increase in the CO2 emissions in the world. And because we have a very, let me say, restricted, ideological, urban approach about mobility, mm. we are focusing on promoting electric vehicle. That's okay. I mean, we were the first company in Spain uh, 14 years ago. Uh, settling a recharging uh, company. So we are part of this business. But we can't forget that for many people, electric vehicle is very expensive. And people, many people in Britain, in France, in Spain, they can't afford to buy an electric vehicle. Mm -hmm. And there are some other ways to decarbonizing mobility. Uh, because we are only supporting with subsidies electric vehicle. What is happening is that the, the, the car fleet is getting older and older. In Spain, it's already eight, 14 years old, the car fleet. In 28, it was eight years old. What is the consequence? That we are not reducing emissions mm -hmm. because we are not boosting and promoting this car fleet renewal. And it will be quite simply supporting people, subsidizing people to buy a new diesel car, a new uh, gasoline car, or a new electric car. I mean, we could reduce in one shot a 30% of the total uh, car uh, emissions in Spain, it will be equivalent, more or less, to have six million electric vehicles on our roads in Spain. The current figure is 300,000, so the impact will be 20 times higher, without less impact in terms of taxpayers. But again, people is focusing on a restricted view of the energy transition, and many people in Britain, in France, in Spain, don't support this view. 
No, I mean, I think it's really interesting, and, and that varied view of the transition and that need to solve both or all three, affordability, reliability, and clean energy. I mean, it's something we focus on a lot in our conversation of the century where we do try to bring together these differing views and understand where there's overlap and where uh, potentially there will be differences. I want to come back to this government policy uh, aspect that you talked about, but first I'd like to give you a bit of an opportunity to, to talk about Repsol's transition strategy. You recently had an investor day. Uh, you yeah. updated and reaffirmed some of your low carbon targets, some of your transition strategy. I mean, what struck me is within that, your 2030 targets, you said something like, you know, m almost every electron, almost every green molecule, low carbon molecule that will help Repsol to achieve that strategy, you know where those are coming from. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about how you're approaching that transition within I mean, First of all, we have a clear view about the carbonizing the company. First of all, let me say, because it's a moral duty. We have to decarbonize the world. But on top of that, we are doing that because we see business and we see returns in this diversification of our company. We were the first oil and gas company in the world committing with the net zero target by 2050. But what is more important, because I mean 2050 is, is very far, we have a comprehensive and we have a clear roadmap and pathway where we have clear milestones to reducing the carbon intensity index of the company, taking our own emissions plus the scope three, the emissions of the products uh, we produce. And we are going to reduce by 2025 in a 15% this, uh, this carbon intensity index, a 28% by 2030, and a 55% by 2040. So we have on track mm -hmm. uh, of doing that. And we have quite ambitious targets, not only in terms of electrons, because when we talk about the carbonizing, every people talks about electricity, and that's okay. But uh, electricity is not the only way to decarbonize the world. We have more than a half of the global economy that is not going to be electrified in coming 20, 25 years. I'm talking about trucks, the maritime sector, the uh, aviation, chemical sector, cement, and so on. So we have to produce electrons, and we have to produce molecules. In terms of molecules, we have the advantage of having a an strong and competitive refining business, mm -hmm. and we are investing hard uh, in projects that uh, where we are uh, taking waste at this stock, and we are already producing more and more renewable fuels that today are part of, uh, of our cars, of the fuel that our cars consume. I mean, uh, everybody is talking, again, about electric mobility that is okay, <laughs> but today, for instance, in Spain, a 10.5% of the fuel in a gasoline or a diesel car is a renewable fuel. And the impact in CO2 terms of this renewable fuel that is already in our roads is equivalent to 4 million electric cars on our roads. Again, the electric car, car fleet in Spain is 300,000 cars. That means that today, renewable fuels are the carbon is in 13 times more than the electric vehicle, but they are not on the political agenda. Everybody is talking about electrifying. And let me say, the cost of the electric vehicle for taxpayer is, again, huge. Because if you calculate what will be the price in terms of subsidy and hydrocarbon tax that is not paid of, of 4 million electric cars on our roads, will be 40 billion euros for the taxpayers. So we are doing 13 times more in the carbonization terms without any penny coming from taxpayers. So that is part also for our history. So we have ambitious targets, ambitious in terms of renewable fuels. We are going to produce more than 2 million tons of renewable fuels by 2030. We are going to start with our, we are already producing 700,000 tons a year. We are going to have uh, our first on purpose plant to do that, producing 250,000 tons uh, at the end of this year. Again, this plant is going to help to reduce 900,000 tons of CO2 mm -hmm. a year. The effect, let me repeat, of 400,000 electric cars. So for the taxpayer, will be 4 billion euros of cost, and we are doing in a plant where Repsol is investing, zero uh, public uh, taxpayer money, and we are going to have returns. So there are a lot of ways, 
very efficient to decarbonize the world, not necessarily electrifying it. So that is a part, mm -hmm. molecules. And we are on track, as you said. We have the projects to cover this, this, uh, this target by 2030. But going to electric part, why we start producing electrons? Because, I mean, concentrated in Spain and Portugal, we have a strong client base. We have more than 14 million clients in Spain and Portugal. And these clients leveraging this position, we start entering the retail power business. And from the scratch, we have built a position where we have already 2 million uh, Spanish homes that are Repsol retail uh, customers. And of course, not having the legacy asset that the utilities have, we start producing our electricity with low carbon uh, businesses. So we start uh, growing in a renewable power business. We already have 2.6 gigawatts in operation fully uh, developed by Repsol, 3.1 more secure. That means that the figure, 6 gigawatts by 2050, 20, 2025, is there. Mm. And we have a pipeline in Spain, Chile, uh, Italy, and United States of 60 gigawatts. So we are very comfortable about the projects by 2030 that they already have names. Well, so I wanted to come back to this policy aspect, um, because as you pointed out, I mean, so much of the transition is being directed in one way or another by policy, and I seem to be picking up that you think maybe policymakers are not quite getting things right. Um, so tell me, I mean, where do you see policy holding things back? Where do you see policy potentially getting things right? What can kind of get us on the right track? What, what would your advice be to so, policy So, you know the tale of uh, Hans Christian Andersen, the, the, the king is naked. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I mean, over the last two years, I have spent a lot of time saying that the king is naked. We are failing, the, mainly in Europe, decarbonizing our economy, and we are creating an economic and social problem on top of a geopolitical problem that we are living today, not having any positive result in the decarbonization terms because the king is naked. Uh, what we are we doing in Europe? We are, uh, in some way, uh, getting, we are making difficult for many uh, energy consume, consum consumers and for many industries consuming energy to operate in Europe. And we are, they are exiting Europe. We are exporting industries. We are exporting jobs. And we are exporting CO2 emissions. And these industries that they operate from, from Turkey, from India, from China, uh, after that, we buy these products in, in Rotterdam, in Barcelona, in Valence, and in, in, in the European ports. We don't take care of the carbon footprint of these products, but they are emitting more in the whole process that what they were emitting in Europe. Today, the combining the Chinese steel and cement sectors, they emit together in China as much as the whole figure of the European emissions. That is the result of our policy. So we need, from my point of view, more technology, less ideology, a broader view, because otherwise, I mean, the, the, the target we have, the ambition we have to decarbonize the world is so huge that we need all the technologies we have. We need natural gas. We have to produce more gas because otherwise coal is going to grow and we are not going to decarbonize the world. We need, we need all the technologies, energy efficiency. I'm going to put an example. The combustion engine debate is awful. It's a big mistake, but, but you could say, okay, we are producing gasoline and diesel, and, 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 and of course, I have some bias for that. No, don't, don't be mistake about that. What is happening in Europe in terms of the debate of the combustion uh, engine? Because people have a concern, and consumers, they don't know, and they, they don't know what kind of car they have to buy. They have a lack of certitude about the decision they have to have. What is happening is that they are delaying the, the buying a car. The car fleet is getting older and older. We are not using the existing technologies to reduce the efficiency, to increase the efficiency of the engines 
and we are not reducing the, the, the CO2 emissions. We are in some way destroying the European automotive industry. Uh, more and more, China is coming to Europe with its cars to, uh, to, to, to fulfill the needs of the European uh, consumers. And on top of that, I mean, the European car makers, they don't have any kind of incentive to invest in the efficiency of the engines. What is the result? The result is that in Repsol, 10 years ago, we had a forecast where we saw that the diesel and gasoline consumption was going down, going down over this decade, and that is not happening. That is not happening because we don't see the renewal of the car fleet, and there is no any kind of improvement in the efficiency of the combustion engines. So, theoretically, a policy focus on reducing emissions is increasing them. That's. But is there anywhere that's getting it right? I mean, you're very active in the US. We've had a number of executives sit up on stage and say, we're singing the praises of the US IRA. Is that the answer? It's, it's a part of the answer. I mean, let me say that I'm very sad talking about that because of, I'm European. <laughs> as you are, and I love Europe, and I want to invest in Europe. I'm also very comfortable in the States. It's a, it's, it's a friend country. We have a lot of activity there. But uh, as the IRA has what we lack here. First of all, stability. They have a clear horizon for coming 10 years. Here, we have uh, the, the, the FIFO 55, uh, the green, um, uh, repowering Europe, the Green Deal. I mean, we are changing the regulation year after year. There is no clarity. And to invest, we need a clear horizon. And, and on top of that, the American view is very supportive uh, to the producers. What we are doing in, in Europe in some ways is to put obstacles to produce uh, hydrocarbons. What is the consequence? That demand is growing, so the price is going to increase. In the States, they are saying, okay, we are going to give you some uh, regulatory and tax support to reduce your operational cost, because doing that, we are going to attract investment, and we are going to anticipate, in some way, the, the maturity curve in the States. So, from my point of view, this carrot approach from the States is a right answer. And the stick approach that sometimes we have in some European policies is not the, the, the right one. So I think that we have a lot to be learned from the United States. But it seems to me, I, I don't want to appear as a, a pessimistic. I think that things are starting to change in Europe because we were talking about this split in European societies. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we are seeing in the European societies that today the energy is a concern. And we, we have to redress, we have to change our pathway in this energy transition. We have to guarantee the security of supply, but we need cheaper energy. We have to put the focus on having cheaper energy in Europe. And it seems to me that some people is starting to be concerned about that. And talking not about Europe, because I mean, we are also in Europe, in Europe, but not in the European Union. Mm -hmm. Going to the European Union, it seems to me that the coming uh, elections from 2024 on and the new European Commission is going to be crucial and key uh, to, 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 to redress, to rethink a bit this energy transition, to be very ambitious in the carbonization terms, no doubt about that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm talking on behalf of a company that this year is going to invest a 42% of the total capex in low carbon businesses. I think that is a quite unique figure in the oil and gas sector. But we need an intelligent energy transition. But let's, let's talk about the capital side of things. Um, you've said that you're concerned that capital markets are just as dogmatic as policymakers in some ways. Uh, Repsol, you were one of the first companies, maybe the first oil and gas company to issue a green bond. Yeah. In, in, 20, in 2016, it was, 2017. It was seen as from, from capital markets as what's an oil and gas company I mean, doing, I, doing issuing a green bond? Is, I mean, this dogmatism is, is, is not simply uh, relegated to, to policymakers. I mean, the, the reception of policymakers, or policymakers, sorry, of, uh, of investors was very positive. The problem is that, let me say, this dogmatic provisionist uh, community, this activism, start attacking the fact that an oil and gas company was issuing a green bond. 
the target of this green bond was reducing the CO2 emissions of a refinery. So I said 4 million tons uh, a year. So 13 times more than the whole effect of the electric vehicle in Spain. Not having any public subsidy, but I mean, we were, we were not pure. <laughs> we were oil and gas. So that is an ideological approach. So what is happening from my point of view with my whole respect in the investors community? I think that there is some kind of a split. On one side, you have a, a part of the ESG investors that they are getting more and more green because they have difficulties with activism and they are constrained and restricted by activists to invest only in pure renewable activities. I mean, it's their decision, but from my point of view, it's a big mistake. I'm going to try to rationalize that. On the other hand, you have the pure oil and gas investors. It's okay, and they say, but you are an oil and gas company. What are you doing uh, investing in, I don't know, in, in, in renewable fuels and these kind of things? Okay, uh, we could discuss that if we take over the last 15 years, the total return of the oil and gas exploration and production sector, perhaps taking the whole period, we could have uh, a strong surprises because every, everybody talks here about the 12, 15% uh, of returns, but if, when you take the historical track record of the sector, they are not there. Uh, but I respect, of course, this approach. But fortunately, we have some other kind of investors, people ready to invest in the energy transition. Mm -hmm. And let me be clear about that. I mean, that is not a revolution. It's a transition. So we have a starting point, that is the current situation, and we have to decarbonize the world, getting net zero. In, 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 in 30 years. So people that say, okay, I'm ready to invest here at the end of the road. Okay, I respect this approach. But you are not committing with the energy transition. We are not committing as investor in the energy transition in real terms. We have a journey and we have to, to invest and we have to finance the whole journey. Because here, at the starting point, you have cement plants, you have steel mills, you have refineries, you have planes. And to decarbonize all that, we need a lot of money ready to reduce the CO2 emissions of our activities. And if you say, uh, okay, I'm not going to invest on you because you are producing natural gas, it's okay, but, but what you are doing is, first of all, you are supporting Putin in your political terms with your attitude, and on the other hand, you are hurting European families because they can't mm -hmm. pay their bill. So that is not the, the real approach. Fortunately, again, I think that there are a lot of responsible investors ready to invest in the energy transition. Our investors are a good example. We have a 40% of our institutional investors in Repsol are people uh, committed with the ES ESG criteria with an open view. Of course, we have tough targets. We have to decarbonize the carbon intensity index and so on, because otherwise they are not going to stay in Repsol. But that is our responsibility. Mm -hmm. So I want to, I've got a stack of questions here that I would love to ask you, but I wanted to give the chance to the audience to ask a question. Um, if there are any out there, uh, just a, a quick show of hands. If not, like I said, I've got plenty. <laughs> Is there anyone uh, to the back? Actually, I'm sorry, uh, here um, in the middle. No, go ahead. We've got the mic closer. <laughs> If there is another one, because well, that, I already that's fine. We'll, we'll grab. We'll grab another. Okay. We'll grab another. Um, thank you very much. Finally, someone actually addressed the big issue uh, in short terms when it comes to European energy security, and that is that Europe is currently lacking around 40 BCM and is not going to find them on the markets, no matter where. So. Um, this is a big issue because our political decision makers are struggling to communicate to the people. And I would like to hear your view on that. I mean, we are already seeing a positive shift. Uh, some countries have signed uh, long-term LNG contracts that will go beyond 2030, obviously. So I would like to take, uh, well, to, 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 to listen to your view um, because I think that in the short term, energy transition will not be possible without securing the energy, um, guaranteeing the energy security. And energy security in Europe without LNG and gas is also 
I think causa so perduta. I, I totally share your point. We, we need it. We, we, we need in Europe, first of all, we decided to get rid of our own uh, local endogenous production. Big mistake. For instance, in Spain, but probably we could see something similar in some other countries. There is a bill, a proof, in the, in the Spanish parliament in 2021, banning any kind of exploration of production to produce natural gas. That is it's awful. Because at the same time that uh, policymakers, the legislative is taking this decision, they were talking and calling to companies to say, please, you have to, 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 to bring cargos from, uh, from the States to Spain because you have to guarantee the security of supply this year. Yeah, it's okay. I fully agree. But we need all the resources we have, starting from our own resources. Secondly, interconnections. And we lost this battle because it would be great to have to cope with this crisis an interconnected European system with the pipes coming from Algeria, pipes coming, unfortunately now, from the east of Europe and coming from the North Sea with a system of LNG terminals that could connect and could provide, for instance, Spain could be uh, uh, some kind of, uh, of, uh, of carrier uh, with all the terminal LNG plants that we have to, to, to supply a part of the continent, Germany and so on. But we lack the interconnections to do that. And, and of course, we need long-term contracts without ideological restriction. Because when you start with some people talking about that, they say, okay, I, I, I want to have a commitment of, of 15 years, but I mean, I'm going to buy gas the first three years, but from, from this, from 2026, 20, 2027 on, uh, I'm going to need hydrogen. So, okay. So we are going to invest in an LNG plant, in a project in the States for coming 20 years to supply you in coming three years. I mean, that, that, that's, that is, we are not kidding. That is a serious game. Mm -hmm. And we have to cope with the security of supply a problem in serious terms. I fully agree with your point. Excellent. We've got time for one more quick question. Uh, the gentleman in the back. Hi there, uh, Davide from uh, uh, Upstream. Um, just also staying on the LNG point, I wanted to ask if you can comment uh, on the action Repsol has taken previously against Venture Global. What then the supply of LNG there? What is the latest? How do you see that progressing? And also, I'd like to understand the implication that you think this action could have for Repsol, but also for the European LNG outlook. Okay, so in, in our case, uh, we are more focused uh, in, uh, in the gas production that in, in the LNG business, that's, I mean, it's part of our business. We produce uh, 600,000 uh, barrels equivalent uh, a day. And nowadays, 67% uh, of our production is, uh, is, uh, is gas. I mean, a 33 could be, uh, uh, oil. We have gas producers in, uh, in, in North America, in Bolivia, in, uh, in, uh, in Trinidad and Tobago. We produce gas in Venezuela, in Algeria, in Indonesia, in Norway. So, I mean, we have a quite broad gas production, mm -hmm. but we are less engaged. We, we are not investing in LNG plants because we think that sometimes they need another kind of investor. I mean, uh, and uh, we, of course, we have gas offtakes to supply our main markets, for mainly coming from, uh, from the Gulf of Mexico. I mean, we are uh, engineers, we are inventors, we are in, uh, in Cameroon, so we have contracts to supply our main markets because, I mean, Repsol is a global company in EMP terms, but when we say our downstream, we are a very local company. I mean, we are an Iberian company, Spanish and, uh, um, and Portuguese. And in some way, I mean, being local, having a strong brand, uh, having a strong client base from this multi-energy approach, I think that is also a competitive advantage to cope with the energy transition journey. Mm -hmm. Well, ladies and gentlemen, unfortunately, we're out of time. Um, so please join me in thanking Yossi Yon. <laughs> and <clears throat> I would say, <laughs> More, more importantly as well, please join me in stepping across the hall to toast Yosion and Repsol for their Energy Innovation Award win in 2023. Thank you.